Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media. And we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You want to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. Hey guys, hey Flo, <laughs> um, sorry. Um, you guys are used to seeing Flo usually, but uh, I'm taking charge and moderating today. But before we get, begin, we had a little bit of an issue with Andrew. Andrew, can you hear us on Skype? Yeah, I yep, I got you. Awesome. Uh, so Andrew had a little bit of an unfortunate incident. So how's everything now? How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Um, I just I wouldn't recommend having your hood open on your car while doing 160 kilometers an hour on the Autobahn. <laughs> It kind of sucks. Now, just And to be for liability issues, was that on purpose or an accident? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, no, but yeah, we're was, just we're all awesome. very worried. Everything's okay no, though. Good. Yeah, everything's fine. It's just um, going to be perfect. I'm going to be a little I'm going to be a little poorer by the time it gets out of the shop. So. Fair. But recovery-wise, can we see you still at the show? What's the uh, deal? This, show, this time around, no. I will be heading out of town again on Wednesday. So okay. bad timing okay. this year. No? Well, this just means next time we just got to do it on a grander scale with you. Exactly. I'm hopefully be there for a week next year at the show. So. Perfect. Perfect. Well, stay recovered, stay healthy. And from the Behind the Mask family, we hope everything goes well. All right. I appreciate it, guys. All right. Take care, man. Bye. <clears throat> do we have to uh, actually end the Skype thing I here, Sonia? Do you know so. if, if that works? Ah, okay. Yeah. He's ending it. Okay, great. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate because to do the session that Andrew was actually supposed to be doing, uh, Photoshop for uh, beginners, we can't do over Skype. Um, so we have to uh, find something else that we can do. And because there are a lot of questions specifically yeah. uh, about how behind the mask like, uh, works and does things. We thought, okay, this is a good opportunity because it's also kind of a little bit of a quiet time during the week to answer the questions they were pointed directly yeah. towards us. And, and that's why I'm sitting on the other side and the taking over <laughs> your job already. Sorry. No, this is a big deal for me. I get to boss you around. Yeah. I'm the boss now. Yeah, yeah you do whatever perfect. you want. Awesome. No, but I think this is good because so many people have so many questions. And you are the man that everyone is always trying to get a hold of. So this is a good session. And I say we dive right into it. So the first question is, um, how do you find the right contacts in the countries, especially wherever you're going? And how do you find these crazy spots? Um, it, well, this is a very uh, like broad uh, question. But um, Like we have a list of destinations and experiences that, that, that we want to do. Uh, and sometimes there is uh, like opportunities or offers coming up to do something that we already have on a list that we really like to do. But we can see that the, the whole frame and the time frame that we have uh, is not really you know, matching to be able to actually uh, do that. Um, so we wait for the right time to do something on a project you know, that is according to our ideals or our own uh, expectations. Uh, and then it's all about the contacts that you have um, beforehand. We, we, many times we approach people just because we, you know, we think they are approachable on Facebook and social media. We explain a little bit what we want to do. Um, and the most uh, important thing is if you um, think about doing a project in another country, obviously, I mean, you know, we are, another country is really difficult to say because 
we don't have a country. We're like a team of yeah, a lot of people from different uh, yeah. uh, countries, obviously. But it's always about finding also a benefit for the people that you work with. Uh, it, it naturally doesn't work to just ask for things. You also need to uh, be able to offer something. And, um, you know, by creating a video or by making content or by supporting in any way, you can actually uh, do something with, which is then not just a project that you do for yourself, but it's more like a, a collaboration with, uh, could be, you know, a scientific uh, institute. It could also be uh, a dive operator, travel operator, or uh, anything else. Yeah, so that goes a lot into the next question that we have. And um, obviously, cost is always such a big issue. So this is a question that Sonia asked, which, which I feel is something that any young videographer will have to worry about. So when it comes to these trips, how do you get sponsored? And it's such as Behind the Mask has an elaborate list of sponsors. So what tips would you give people? Okay, I think like this question points towards uh, the general sponsoring because people uh, think, okay, there's a lot of brands involved, um, so the brand's probably gonna pay a lot of things and give a lot of equipment, and how do we get into a position where I can actually benefit from something like this? And it's kind of a similar uh, answer, because everybody like dreams big, and everybody thinks yeah. like, okay, this is cool, like I, if I would have this kind of support, I could do this and this and that. But I think to um, be able to find partners who actually support what you're doing, you have to see the whole scenario from their position. And you have to understand that like the, the law of economics don't allow that you know, yeah. things are just given away yeah. and flowing around. And uh, of course you can get some equipment to test or stuff like that. But if you look for like um, a long lasting uh, partnership with a brand, because this is most of the time it starts with this, you know, like yeah. you, you have an activity that you like doing, like for us, we film, so of course we like the brands who make the, the amazing cameras and, you know, and the housings for it. And of course it all costs a lot. So you think like, oh, it would be so amazing if we can just get it and do everything with it for free. But this is not the way it works. It basically works the other way around. You would have to first I mean, the way we work is always, we always want to be one step ahead all the expectations that are going towards us. Yeah. And not the other way around. Because it will limit you in everything that you do, if you have a certain pressure and a certain expectation behind that you have to meet, and it's not even in, you know, like naturally in, in what you're doing, you have to get out of your way and you have to satisfy uh, a sponsor's need and it's maybe not what you want to do. So in the end, nobody's really going to be happy. Yeah. So you need to find the right sponsors and you need to, um, like the right brands, and you need to be able to provide um, a value in return. And not only in return, you would also have to invest to actually provide that value before you get anything in return. And this is basically, I mean, we've been doing this for quite a while now, I think five, five and a half uh, years. And one big effort was always to find the right partners and not the right partners who are like super you know, giving you a lot of things, but the partners that you actually can stay with and that you can develop yeah. a relationship over a long period of time so that everybody kind of feels good and is happy when you call them. Yeah. You know, it's not like you call them and you promise. Yeah. Then you receive something and after that you better don't call anymore, you know, because you feel like, no, I still <laughs> owe them something or whatever. So it is very important to prove that you can actually be of yeah. some kind of value. And I mean, of course, social media and the outreach uh, on people and having people following you helps a lot because this is a tool that we before we never had you know before we had social media like what you want to do to make people actually see what you're what you're doing and and also um, like lead by a good example and not just telling like okay this kind of product is amazing but actually use it yeah, and yeah. if you really think it's amazing then it's great but the worst thing you can end up with is to promote something that you actually don't believe in yeah. So it's a mixture of everything, but the ball is in your part of the yard. Yeah. You have to yeah. pick it up. You have to uh, create a value. And that also leads, most of the time, leads to uh, projects where you invest and where you make something and then approach the potential sponsor that you're interested in and say like, hey, you know, I did this. I think this is what you could use. Um, do you think we can uh, do something together in the future? Because you know, I'm capable yeah. of doing things yeah. and not just like, hey, I have an Instagram account and if you give yeah. me a housing, I'm gonna have amazing uh, following and then I can do whatever. It's not, it's, yeah. not, it's not working that way. 
and I think the exact word you used, invest, I think that's very important. Just from working with you, what I've realized is with social media, we always think, like you said, if you have the viewer count, you can just go to these sponsors and say, let's do this. But you yeah. have to invest in the relationship. So oh, specifically... Th 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 there's another thing to it. Like, many times it's much better to not have a sponsoring. Yeah, very true. Because if you have like, if you have like three, four, five uh, sponsorings, yeah. you have to satisfy exactly. all the needs. Like, for they example, when we went needs. to the Antarctica project, we made 12 different productions for the sponsors before we even were able to, do, to deal with our own stuff that we shot. Yeah. Because everybody brings their watch brand, everybody brings yeah. their equipment brand, everybody brings their like, you know, yeah. camera brand and everything else. And then all of a sudden you go like, yeah, of course we have the budget. We can do this amazing project. But at the end you sit there for a month yeah. to give everybody w what, what they, they want. wanted. Exactly. And then you're not even started to do your own thing. So it yeah. kills kind of the, the passion sometimes. And you feel like, okay, if I pay that by myself, and I focus yeah. on something, I create a value on another end. And that's why the best thing always is to have like one partner that you can work with and not like five different ones who give a little bit here and give a little bit there. Yeah. So in the end, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. A it's, a, it's, also, it's also a business decision. It's not just, yeah, for sure. You're it's nice to have somebody supporting yeah. you, but at the end, you got to give something back. Yeah. Uh, in return. So in terms of, can you give an example? Because from when it comes to social media and I see the young videographers that are trying to get into this industry, can you give an example of a long-term partner that you've had that this is the framework that worked? Because it's not yeah, just I a can give you a very thing. simple one because uh, obviously everybody's looking out for like huge housing brands, but of this course, is like yeah. a huge value. I mean, the housings yeah. that we use, they're up to like, I don't know, 20,000 euro. It's very difficult to actually do that. You would also have to be... Um, invested and, 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 and put a lot of effort in helping to test things and provide yeah. things on the side and stuff like that. This is probably a little bit more specific. But if you look out for like equipment, I remember, hey Warren, if you're looking, if you're watching. <laughs> hey Warren. Um, you know, I just said like, we, we saw some of the uh, diving fashion, like s suits that we yeah. liked. At that time it was uh, a brand called Sharkskin and they were using a technology. They were supposed to help you to get closer to marine life. That's the hex technology. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought we're in the Bahamas. We do something with the sharks. We have actually a pretty cool video that we can show that we are pretty close to the sharks. So maybe we can make that video in a sense that we can give to the, yeah. uh, to the, to the brand and to show them, like, with this video, you might be able to promote your technology because exactly. the claim is um, get closer. Yeah. Uh, and then it turned out that the technology was actually not belonging to shark skin to the shark skin uh, fashion Company, brand but yeah, yeah. was actually uh, licensed by someone else and then you get that contact and then you all of a sudden you talk to a guy in New Zealand um, and tell him okay this is us this is what we're doing and he's asking what do you want from me so I, I don't want to do any I, I don't want anything I just like this is if you can use this yeah. you know if you want us to maybe test dive your stuff or anything like that then you can send it in return and yeah. the first thing I got was like a, a prototype of a suit uh, didn't really fit well didn't really last long. It was not really a pleasure to wear it. And you go like, well, is this what I get when I, uh, you know, <laughs> when I have a support uh, of someone? But then you realize, okay, so I can be actually, f I can deliver a different benefit. Exactly. I can really test dive the thing and go like, okay, so here, here it's opening up. This spot on the gloves is really bad. Like I use it three times with the camera and all of a sudden my finger sticks out and they appreciate this kind of, uh, of feedback. Course, yeah. And then all of a sudden you realize, and it also, like the chemistry between Warren and us was very good. Yeah. Um, so it kind of developed from you get another suit and all of a sudden you get a suit with your logo on it. And you go like, hey, cool, that's, that's yeah. amazing. That looks super nice. And we still wear the suits. Yeah, uh, we do. And, yeah. you know, and then all of a sudden a lot of people also you know, get into this marketing thing and it's, a, yeah. it's actually a pretty, pretty cool brand in the end and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and always, I mean, th in this case, it's easy because a lot of people see the videos that we produce and wearing the, the suits is not an extra effort. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you know, and then there's a little package coming with a suit for my knees because I told him that we do a, a shoot with my knees and then my knees had a, a branded wetsuit. And it's all nice. It's not something that helps you survive to do your things. But it's a very good example that if you do something first and that you actually try to give a benefit, um, you know, yeah. to your to It's your a partner different way to manage your, these relationships, yes. these business relationships. Yeah. And yeah. of course, if you promise anyone that you're gonna have a certain outreach and that a lot of people follow you, you don't even start to do that because it's not gonna work. You, you can't yeah. really prove it. And this is also something that needs to be 
coming towards you from the people who want to work with you. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the same like when you go out into the world, it's like I'm an artist. Nobody's gonna, gonna relate to that. Other people would have to tell you that. So if somebody sees what you do and think like, it would be cool if these guys would wear our things, then it works. Okay. But to prove anything about how many people saw your Instagram stories and how many yeah. times you tag someone and stuff like this, I yeah. think this is over. Uh, everybody understands that this is not something that you can, unless you are like, you have like a million of uh, yeah, followers, but for then sure. it's, for sure. uh, no, it's no. a different way. That's a very well, well way to put it. Okay. Uh, just reminding everyone, we've taken over this live stream because Andrew got into an unfortunate accident. So now I am the boss of Behind the Mask for this live stream. And we're just talking to Flo and finding out different things that people have been asking the Behind the Mask family, just to find out how these trips work. So we've been dealing with the sponsorship side, which is always something people always ask. But if we go more onto the technical side now, in terms of when you're filming. So Zoobs was asking this really cool question in terms of what's your average ratio of shots taken to what he calls the true keepers. So by true keepers, he means shots that stand out from every aspect when it comes to focus, lighting, and stuff. The good shots that you can use. Yeah. Uh, it's getting less and less. <laughs> in the beginning, it was a lot of rubbish, of course, yeah. because the more you experiment, and I actually don't like it that it's getting less and less, because it also means that you do things over and over again, and you basically yeah. don't explore different other techniques and stuff like yeah. that. But um, it also depends on the, the kind of camera system you use. And I mean, I use most of the time an 8K full frame red camera, which has like uh, one magazine, like one memory card is a terabyte. And it's not even an hour of shooting. Yeah. So you can't really allow yourself to bring back like a lot of things because you have to like every day. I mean, imagine you do like four yeah, dives a day crazy. for like, you know, yeah. and then in the end you have like tons of footage and we can't really afford to have that. Um, so I think um, for me, most of the shots I take um, are okay to use. This is because I have a lot of experience with the, with the system. Um, and I would also recommend everybody to look into it a little bit and to be aware that it is not a great thing to have a lot of footage. I mean, the worst thing you can start with is a lot of footage. Okay. Because you have to get everything under control. And there's a lot of things hidden in it. And you have to really find a process in your own post-production process where you can ensure that you don't have to look through everything twice or three times. And the worst thing is that you remember there was the one shot and you don't find it anymore. Yeah. You know, so this is like... It is good if it's not like, like to have a GoPro running on top of your camera, like for the whole dive is a good thing. If you are in a very like specific uh, scenario where yeah. you know, oh, uh, you know, you go diving with a leopard seal in Antarctica, of course you get that camera running yeah. because if anything happens with your big camera, you're never going to be able to get back to this situation. But on a normal dive, uh, I would not recommend doing that because you end up with a lot of footage that you, n that will always be like pushing you. Uh, I have to yeah, do this, yeah. I have to do this. Uh, I would prefer much more to actually specifically um, shoot for things and then go to your laptop in the evening, no matter if you're on a boat or in a resort, it doesn't matter, but really get this footage under control. And not only for yourself, but also for the people that you're working with. Bring everyone together. I mean, you know how we do it. Yeah. You know, we look at everything, we sort things out, and everybody gets a peek. Everybody's going like, ah, oh, okay, you know, if you yeah. work with Dada, for example, and she's free diving, this is a great moment for her to actually see what, what we did. Yeah. So we have a common ground to actually improve everything we're doing. If we have another, another assistant helping me filming or anything, yeah. he needs to see what we actually do. It's not like Flo is disappearing, and after three months, he's coming out with a video, and everybody says, great. This is yeah. a team effort. Everybody is you know, sharing ideas and things. And so you can improve from one day to another and you can keep the, you know, the rubbish uh, low because you know this works, this doesn't work. Yeah. And you can get more efficient. I think efficient is the, is yeah. the key word here. So if you're looking at, if you can give some advice to the young videographers that are starting, you would say focus on the quality instead of the quantity. Well, I would say in the beginning, of course, you got to know your gear. Yeah. You know, it's not like I want to have, I have this shot in mind, but I don't know how I get it. Obviously, you know, you have to try a lot of things and you always have to do something different and experiment a lot. Yeah. But if you find something that, catches your, that, that will catch your attention, yeah. you know, for me, like we have a lot of things that we thought, okay, if we turn the camera around, you know, flip it around and we film when the sun is low and yeah. you have the nice rays. It's just an just easy example. Yeah. I really like that, you know, play with the light. So I focus yeah. on it. 
I do it more and I try to advance and progress in this kind of creative little bubble a little bit more. And then there's other things, you know, that just pop up. It's not like, you're not like just a blind, you know, guy with a blind mind filming things and then, ha, ah. you, you, <laughs> you, you follow what catches your attention yeah. and then you improve it and then there's branching things off. You find something else that worked yeah. really well. Or sometimes it's just by accident and you're like, that looks amazing. Yeah. So you try to recreate it. And also yeah. a lot of times you shoot something uh, especially if it's repeatable, if there is an animal behavior that's been, you know, going on for a while and you know this is going to be, you know, this is what the animal does and you can shoot it a lot of times, a lot of times, you basically start shooting it from a very, like from a non-destructive point of view. Like mm -hmm. if there is a guitar shark laying somewhere, you know, a shy guy, you're not going to go in front of his face and trying to yeah, get the yeah. shot because you're probably not going to get anything because you're going to scare it away. Yeah. So you start without lights, you go a little bit further away and you stay there, you try to, you know, and then many times they just go away and you think like, mm, would have been better, I just go there because it goes away anyway. But it never is a good shot if the animal is scared away anyway, it's, it's not gonna 100%. work. 100%. So yeah. slowly, you know, and yeah. then you already know. I, uh, many times I delete things from my camera without even watching it because I remember I've been sitting at that guitar shark, I shot it for a while, but the shot was the last one. And all of it before, was not very good, but it was more safe. So you, you know, yeah. you kind of. Yeah. Huh. And I think that's a thing. That's actually a big thing because even when you're starting from far away and you're slowly filming, you're still shooting a certain storyboard. Yes. People forget that. Whereas the amateur videographer, like for example, I would just run in and try and film and then be upset that I didn't catch it. But by filming from different angles, from further away, you're actually creating a story. Exactly, that and that's, that's another point which is very, very important. You know, it's not like going, I mean, we are very opportunistic yeah. because we don't have uh, a contract with wildlife. We don't pay them to exactly. do what we want them to do. They don't care about no, us. No, we just <laughs> guess we go there, things happen, and you just hope to be at the right place at the right time. So yeah. you always have to follow what, you know, what is in front of you yeah. and what is basically given to you. But many times there's also things that have like kind of a routine. You know, if you have mantas on a, on a cleaning station, you yeah. know from which direction they will come. They go against the current. Yeah. You know what they want. They want to be cleaned. So they want to be standing there. So you know exactly where you actually have to be to get different angles of the same thing exactly. so that you can actually tell a story yeah. of... And it's not, it's not easy, you know, if, you, no, if you're no, somewhere no. hooked in with your hook and film yeah. something from one perspective. If you film it for half an hour, you can only use five seconds. Exactly. Because you cannot, you, you know, you don't want to show something super long, yeah. but you want to show it from an angle that you usually don't have. Yeah. You want to get it, like, it, it would be nice to have a shot up below and just film up so that you have the manta in, uh, on yeah. top of you. So you kind of think about how can I capture the same thing in a different way. Yeah. And then you can make a story out of it. 100%. And this is what, you know, then it's very easy to define which, which is the shot that I like and which is the shot that is actually not usable. Yeah. And a lot of people say, why do you throw this away or why do you not use this? It looks very nice. It's like, because this has no connection to anything else and it would just be a nice yeah. impression. So you can't really tell a story. Yeah, yeah. And a story is not a complex thing. A story is, can only be a movement. You know, if the, if, the, if, the, if the manta swims out of the frame this way and the next frame it swims in from the other side, it's, it's already a connection. Yeah, it's yeah. already a story, right? So it's, it's all about finding the yeah. right connections and pieces to piece something together that in the end looks like it was shot at the same time with different cameras. And yeah. you all think like, okay, but this was shot from the other side, so where's the cameraman on the other side? So it's basically this yeah, kind yeah. of uh, no. little things. Perfect. Let's stick to the technical stuff. So Zoobs again was asking, what monitor do you use for editing? If you calibrate it, what standard do you calibrate yeah, to work I, for both I, photos I, and videos? I, I forgot about, I, I don't care about that. Like I, I never cared about this. Because we work in an environment where our output is a million different monitors with a million different settings. Like people gonna look at it on an iPhone, on an Android phone, on like a shabby old, I don't know, big monitor in your grandma's house. They, they have like fancy iPads yeah, and things sure. like that. So I don't really calibrate a monitor. What I do, I look at the levels because you have like RGB parade levels yeah. where you can see which, you know, yeah. which part is overexposed. And there is a certain line that has the, like on the, 
on the dark tones and the dialysis where you know there is no more information. So you s try to stay in between that. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you can't really do yeah. anything about it. Obviously, you need to make sure that your monitor is not like uh, has like a color tint or anything like this. Yeah. But we're not working in the print industry where you in the end have like a product in your hand and it's going to look like the same. Yeah. But it's always it's always difficult. Yeah. And there's so many mediums that people are viewing your media on. Exactly. Perfect. For videos, what do you think is a reasonable distance from the subject? if taking cropping in post into consideration. If in you, what is it? In, if in taking other, cropping yeah. in post into consideration, yeah, yeah, okay. <coughs> well, it depends. If you film something that is happening there, which is super rare and super difficult to film, you're not gonna worry about anything, you just film it. Yeah. But if you can choose it, if you, if you, like, if you stay somewhere where you have like an amazing reef scape and you film things, I mean, f for me, um, to have a very high uh, quality that give you a lot of room in post-production and it, it's really like looking like the ocean would look like if there would be no water. Uh, in this case, it's kind of a trick um, because you try to be as close as you can, but at the same time, you try to give the impression that you're actually not that close. Yeah. And you can only do that with a very wide angle uh, lens. Sometimes it's, it's ridiculous. Like you think, oh, look at that. Uh, you know, but you are actually like only 10 centimeters away from it. So the challenge yeah. here is actually how do I get close? Because if you, if you can get close, you should even get a little bit closer if you can. Because the light will affect everything a little bit more, so you can be more creative with the things that you bring in, like light, and if you work with filters or, yeah. or tripods or anything like that, you, can, you have a way more room to do anything. So it, it's very difficult to say how close you need to get. Yeah, there's of course, you want to be as wide as you can to get more into the frame, especially if you have like a high resolution and you can crop in afterwards. But um, I think the, the most important thing is to get like a lot of detail and a lot of contrast like within the information of your photo. Even though you shoot a very flat picture profile, you still want to get all the different information. And you only get that by having as less water as possible between you and the object that you're yeah. filming. So. I, for me, it's always just go as close as you can. Yeah. And I think added to this, and I think this is one thing that sets behind the mask apart, is when it comes to videoing, we touched on this briefly, about how you want to film from different angles, from different viewpoints. But there's also a certain code of conduct that we have when it comes to <coughs> filming these animals. Now, it's unfortunate, but in the dive industry, <coughs> you have a lot of people who will chase the animals away. So I've, what I've realized from working with you is you have a special way of interacting with these animals and predicting well, how they're going to move? Well, first of all, I think what we have to understand is that we cannot um, affect, re like, like really actively affect uh, the behavior of the animal because it's not in our benefit. Exactly. Uh, of course you can do that. Of course you can scale things away and you can like yeah. poke things or whatever. It's never going to lead to an acceptable shot. Yeah. Because what you need to portray an animal in a movement is you need to see the animal from the front. I mean, ideally, a whale shark from the front opening the mouth like this into your camera. That'd be it's nice. Not, not, gonna, not gonna work like this. But in general, it, like in animal photography, if you don't see the eye clearly, you don't get a connection. With the, you know, with the animals in the water, it's even more difficult because they don't relate to the, you know, to the, as you say, mimic. Yeah. yeah. We have. I think this is also the reason why people are very easy to kill fish because they don't look unhappy when you kill them. Yeah. You know, they, they there's just, no they, emotional you, know, you can't really relate to the emotions that they have. And they, so it's a different level about understanding the behavior and the routine they have. And I'm not a scientist. I have no clue about things, but I can observe. And I know how things gonna, you know, I, I, it's easy to predict if you're not like just think, there's a shark. I need to film it now, yeah. fast. Now you need, you need to wait. You need to wait. You need to look at it, and you know, you, you, I don't even try, you know, to film yeah. it in in the first place. You wait for it, and you see what's going on. And I would rather film a very uninteresting object, but in a real nice way, and from a real angle, real nice angle. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you can film something a little bit from below, you already have an angle that a normal diver would never see. Yeah. So everybody who's seeing that is not feeling like, yeah, I've been there, I've done that. They were also like, hmm, I've never seen it like this. So it's more, uh, it's more interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is one thing. And another thing is uh, that you have to come to a point before you start filming that you have your diving skills totally under control. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, this is the most uh, important thing, and that you really like. I mean, it's never worth to uh, break anything, to you know, touch the wrong place, or to do anything, or to scare anything away, or to poke anything. It's not because it will not lead to good photo. Yeah. Like, I mean, it might lead to good photo, probably. You know, I've seen people doing horrible stuff and having yeah. great photos, but for the video, no. that's not just the moment. This is like, a, you know, a, a little bit of behavior, and and you, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the you shark's not gonna away. come by and give yeah. you a kiss <laughs> if you, you know, if you poke it or if you do anything. You know, it's not yeah, yeah. not gonna work. You can't hide away from video. Yeah. Which so is apart from the fact that it's not yeah. the code that we have, also it's not gonna help you. Yeah, I fully agree. Okay, the last one from Zoobs was, how much of a crop percentage of 4K clips do you believe is the limit before losing quality? 140 percent. 140. <laughs> yes, if you have like a, a full HD image on a full a HD canvas timeline, you can still crop 140%, depending of yeah. obviously on the quality of the picture. Okay. If you film like uh, in, in a very low bit rate and uh, you know, you already have kind of artifacts uh, in it uh, and the picture is not really crisp and nice, but if you have good standard footage, like yeah. good footage that you actually, I, I, I think you can zoom in like okay. 140%. But for the regular viewers at home and here, can you explain that in simple terms? What are we talking about when we say crop percentage? Okay, so you have a window that defines the size and the pixels of your video. It, for a long time, this was uh, 1920 to 1080. This is HD. This is what this monitor can display. Yeah. This is basically 1920 pixels this way and yeah. 1080 Going this down, way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, 1080 this way. Yeah. Okay, it's always 16 by 9 ratio before it was I don't know 720p now we are at 4k it, it doesn't matter so you have a picture that has exactly that size so now sometimes you want to you know you film something on the side that you don't like and you want to zoom a little bit in and on the same out, yeah. canvas so you're basically showing more pixels that you didn't have before because exactly. you make something yeah. bigger and you don't there is no more pixels av available, but so, so so the software will basically fill that with the tones in between and just like It'll and predict if it you in if you go into your editing software and you take the clip and it's in 100% on your timeline fitting well, if you then put in the transformation tool and you go like 140% scaling it up, making it bigger, that's for me is kind of the limit. I think yeah. that works okay. Before you destroy, the yeah, but this is ro just rule of thumb. If you have bad yeah. footage, you I wouldn't do that. If you have very good footage, sometimes you know. Yeah. You can even I mean you can even like for for online use, for social media and stuff, you can even scale HD footage up to 4K. Nobody gonna realize. If somebody saw the Orca Kingdom video, mm -hmm. all the land shots are filmed in HD, and the whole thing is in really? 4K. So we just scaled everything up, yeah. and nobody's going to realize. Interesting. Huh. Well, I mean, if you go to Netflix and try to sell something to Netflix, and you yeah. tell them that, they're going to go like, <laughs> we're not going to do that. Yeah. But nobody's going to see it. Did yeah, you see yeah. it? I didn't know it okay. was full HD. OK, from Max. What did, you feel is in the moment when, what did you feel in the moment when the orcas came close? Uh, nothing. Wow. Because I, I was know filming if that's them. That's what you want to say for on live stream. No, <laughs> this is a huge uh, issue with filming things. You're not there in the moment. Like yeah, for me, the moment true. that I really feel something is when I don't use yeah. the camera to actually do you're something. Like staring the only moment that kind of had both was the one moment when I was inside of the herrings and the big male basically just came straight at me. But but that time I never, f I didn't focus on the camera anymore. I just thought to myself, hold the camera still, and please just don't do anything wrong because I, I tend to do really stupid things in moments like this. <laughs> you know, I tend to like push a button and all of a sudden you're like, I have amazing footage of amazing things happening, but I don't have the actual moment. I only have the things when I thought the camera is off. You know, you sometimes get into like a vicious circle where yeah. you think now I record, but you actually stop the recording. Yeah. And then the next time you think, yeah, it's not interesting anymore. And you push the button again and then you start recording. So you think like, where is the sperm whale giving birth? You know, it's like gone. <laughs> I thought I filmed it. Yeah. <laughs> so in this case, yes. But most of the time, this is, I think, a, a very important thing. Um, because w if you want to have an experience, you can't have a camera. Because if you, you know, I've been working in a, in a very um, sad and dramatic scenario before in the civil war in, in Burma. Yeah. 
that actually helps if you film something really, really bad, like a landmine victim or something. It really helps because you film through a camera and you can do your job. If you don't have a camera, you look at it, you're probably yeah. not going to be able to stand it. It's too emotional. And yeah. in, this, in this case, it's exactly the, the other way around. Like yeah. you are there, you capture it, but you live the emotions later, especially years later when you look at the stuff that you've been doing and you forgot actually yeah. how you did it that time. And you kind of have the pleasure to be in the same seat like the, audi like the audience that's going to see it for the first time. And because this is a, is a burden. You know everything, you know all the edits that you've done, you know about the moment that was there when you were trying to get this orca in focus and not the moment that the freedivers have when they go like, I had an interaction. Yeah. You know, we had a connection. Yeah, of <laughs> course, I, I, I mean, the connection is on a completely different level yeah. because you have to find a way to actually capture a moment and not mm -hmm. be in this moment. Yeah. It's a completely different thing. And I think sometimes in our industry, people are too afraid to admit it when you're filming, there is a certain mental block that's there. So Can you, do you remember when we've been filming the orcas that Dada had a camera <laughs> and she produced <laughs> completely out of focus for like five days? I mean, I don't want to say it, but it, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> she was basically filming me and I was filming uh, her and I don't have a single shot uh, actually doing all of this <laughs> because she's in the moment and yeah. she's not... Uh, you know, taking care of anything in her, in her camera, and I'm doing exactly the, the other way around. Yeah. So this is how it works. I mean, this is my job. So no? Fair, fair. Thank you for being honest with us. Well. So Andre says, in your experience, for cinematic wide-angle composition, when do you take low angle, high angle, or eye level angle? So it's just the, the orientation. Well, it, it totally depends, because a wide angle is, everything can be, uh, like, it depends what you're filming. Uh, I think, um, especially if you have backlight scenarios, I really like to go a little bit lower because I um, like one technique is that you actually use the light to lighten up the foreground, but have the nice rays coming down yeah. in the background. It works really well if you shoot a little bit up. I think um, I always try to shoot up when we shoot animals, you know, like because if you shoot something slightly down, you make it small. If you photograph your kid, you're never gonna, you go down on your knees to film, like to photograph it from the front. Yeah. Because you're not wanna, like you're not, also the normal angle that every, every diver gonna see something most of the time is from above. So yeah. it's not something that you think is interesting. It's not it is, different. It, is, or, it yeah. is, yeah, it feels yeah. familiar. Yeah. So you need to find a different angle. And with yeah. the camera, it's very easy to sometimes just hold it. Yeah. So it films up and you don't even have to look uh, through the viewfinder, but I do it a lot of times yeah. because it's just easy to get uh, another angle. Yep. I think like pointing slightly down really works only if it's like a reef scape or it's yeah. something that you don't have another choice. Yeah. But you either go completely from the top or at least yeah. eye level. Or I really like to make things bigger and, and, and give like the hero attitude to whatever yeah. fish you're filming and, you know, and get that angle that is not very familiar. And I think people don't realize how the, these angles make such a big difference. Even if I had a little GoPro and I went down and I shot up, it's just a very different angle yeah. from what everyone is of used course, to seeing. It sounds easy, but obviously a lot of things just happen and they only happen one time and you're yeah. just happy to get a shot so you don't get into exactly. that position to actually be able to yeah. do that. But if you have a choice and in an e uh, ideal world, yeah. you have to do that. Uh, yeah. The next question is a bit of a philosophical one, so I hope you're ready. Uh -uh. Okay. In this world full of unaccomplished dreams, everyone's goal is to be happy, I guess. Underwater life has changed my life, and I would like to show everyone else how it did it through my videos. The question is, how did you do it? Did you quit your job to do so? Did you start from kids? Or what were the steps that you followed? Oh. And this is a big one, because Ooh. I feel like a lot of people have this question when, they th when they're talking to you. Um. I don't think it's very philosophical. I think you, we can break it down to very easy, because it's kind of rational decisions. I think there's a lot of uh, unspecific things between yeah. the lines, but in general, it's kind of a, a decision. I mean, I, I, thi I mean, it is very difficult to talk about it because it will not going to be, we're not going to be able to transfer this into, you know, onto any, any, yeah. anybody a else's, li anyone template. else's life. Yeah. You know, it's uh, for me, um, like my goal in life is to be able to do what I love and make a living with it at the same time. 
You know, I, I'm really afraid of the situation that you do something that you really like, but you are not able to do it and you have to do something else to do that. Or if you get a, get, give a lot of purpose into what other people think what you're doing. Yeah. I this agree. is a problem. Because if you do something that is purely made for other people to look at it and think this is great, then you p depend on something like this and it will definitely make you depressed. This is, uh, f for example, there's a lot of times people call me and say, okay, we, we, we want to do this film project, which is a documentary about like one hour. And uh, how do you think we should do that? And I always say, I, sh I think you should not do that at all. Because either you have like an amazing funding and framework like Laurent Ballesta has when he does yeah. his things, or you're go definitely going to end up with like asking a lot of favors from a lot of friends, uh, investing a lot of time in something, and in the end, you depend on other people liking it and being it successful, especially if it's like a conservation-minded project, yeah. you end up sitting there frustrated that the whole world has not been waiting on the film that you've been making and you've been investing a lot of time and money to do that. So for us, it was always clear. We want to produce as much content as we can and we want to be able to improve from each film that we make and we want to be able to make complete bullshit videos <laughs> and we want to be able to make mistakes and we want to be able to exactly. fail and we want to be able to laugh about ourselves. You're not going to laugh about yourself. You look back and go like, okay, I invested two years of my life and all the money I had on something that I really feel bad now or, you know, yeah. this is so, and this is how Behind the Mask was able to start from a very small thing, from a very small idea which just two guys said like, hey, it would be cool if we can go diving for free. So like, okay, I can film, I can make photos. <laughs> I'm a cool travel guy, so hey, let's do yeah. something and uh, so we can go diving for free. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the video thing was a little bit more uh, demanded and then uh, yeah. it, the opportunities came along. But as that, that is always like, because I was running an, uh, or I, together with two friends, I was working in the advertising uh, industry and so I know what I don't want. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be uh, a boss of a company. We had 18 employees and I really know how it feels like when you do stuff. Yeah. But it's never get like it's not an immediate return of invest. Like you do a project, it takes half a year. And even if you design something after half a year, it looks completely different. And it's always only about managing people. And yeah. I never wanted that. So for me, it was clear as soon as I have the option, I want to find like minded people who actually do something and we can do something and construct something uh, together. And if you do that, it might seem that I am in the middle of all of this, but I'm actually uh, not. I'm basically just giving away all the things. And, and I mean, you know, people ask, what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing? You're the good vibration manager. You're one of the most important people <laughs> in the whole team. You know, because we have tons of fun together. You enable everybody else to have like, you know, a great uh, spirit. And you're a great filmmaker as well. So... You know, uh, we, just do you. It, we just do it together. And I <laughs> yeah. believe if you do something together with other people, it will always be a positive thing. I, I mean, now this time we're like 16 people in our uh, apartment over there. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's a big family. A now. lot of us never met each other or anything. Yeah. We get along well. I think it's yeah. about the mindset and about being able to, you know, not think like I achieved this. I need to keep it for myself. Yeah. You know, it will only grow if you give it away. Yeah. So, and this is I basically uh, how it works. I know this is definitely not a satisfying answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, I mean, this is basically uh, what it is. And yes, yeah. and then at a certain time, you probably get into the position that you say, okay, now I can actually quit my job. But that's the holy grail. No, it's not the holy grail. It's, it's basically just a side effect. Because if that's the priority, you're going to be ending up in a position where you have to make money with what you love You're to doing do something yeah. and you have to make the money first and you have to have like the resources first and then quit your job and not go like I quit my job because you 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 see a lot of people who are very frustrated yeah, yeah. that they are not able to actually do what they like and other people appreciate yeah. it so that's yeah. the yeah that's We're very important unfortunately running out of time but I want to le let you end it but before I let you end it I think one of the best things about this workshop the various workshops that we've already done is we're connecting the whole world to these people who are experts in their field because there's always been that gap. So from what I've been trying to do when we're on these stages is try and find that connection where 
the people who we're interviewing can say something to give some sort of advice based on what they've seen. So if you had one thing you could tell people, just advice based on your journey in creating Behind the Mask, what would you say? Well, for me, I think this applies to uh, many aspects of life. I think don't be afraid to close doors because other doors will open. You know, if you are afraid and if you think, ah, it's not going to work this way, but if I do that, then this is an effect and then I... Uh, you should forget about wasting energy on that. You know exactly what you feel like. Yeah. And as long as you are able to react according to your feelings, there will be always doors opening uh, for you. Because I see a lot of people struggling with life decisions. I would like to do that, but <laughs> if I do that, then I do it like completely differently than my parents raised me, you know, or s whatever, or I disappoint someone or yeah. whatever, you know, like, nah, nah, nah. I, um, you know, if you can make a clear cut on something, don't be afraid. You're not going to sit there alone and the world around is dark. It's, it's always like if you change your situation in life with something, there will always be a completely different scenario and there will be more opportunities. Yeah. And these I opportunities, agree. in my experience, were always great. And there were always the moments where I had the feeling I benefit the most. Right. Awesome. Thank you for your time, Flo, and I hope everyone learned a little bit more about you. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> um, I, for today, we're done with the live streams. Mm -hmm. Perfect.